to the book of Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Here's what the Bible says. Now the Lord has said to Abram, remember, let me stop there. If you see Abram and Sarai, this is before their names were changed. But this is actually Abraham and Sarah. So I'll use those names just for the sake of conjecture. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from around your family and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you and I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make your name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Notice God doesn't bless him without giving him the orders to also be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee. God doesn't bless them that bless him and curse them that curse him because he's better than anybody else. He blesses them that blesses him and curses them that curses him because he is a blessing. Getting a blessing protects you from poverty. Being a blessing protects you from people. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Not only will I bless you, watch this. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Did you know that God can <laughs> bless your whole family because you decided to be a blessing? Just touch somebody and say, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to be a blessing. All right. Now we got the blessing part, right? All right. Now here it is. So Abraham departed. As the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him and Abraham was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran and Abraham took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance watch this and all that they gathered and the souls that they had gathered and got in Haran and they went forth to go into Canaan I am I am so confused right now okay let's go back and hear what God says Abraham, leave the country and leave your kinfolk. Okay. Verse 5. And Abraham took his wife, his, 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 his. <laughs> he took everybody. And God had just said. See, the mark of a blessing is not what you're willing to go to, but it's what you're willing to leave behind. I want to talk on this subject. It'll make sense in a moment. This is what I want to talk about. Tested by tears. I want you to touch everybody you can touch on your way down and say, if you've been crying lately, God is testing you by tears. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. How many of y'all feel like this word is for you already? like a punctuation mark to a sentence. Lot's name is inserted periodically to break up the monotony of a story, a text that starts in chapter number 11 and does not reach its conclusion until chapter 13. Without punctuation marks, a sentence is nothing more than a run-on. And without the insertion of Lot, this story would get away from us. If Abraham's life is the sentence, then Lot's life is the comma, causing us to Paul circumspectly to observe exactly what it is God is saying and what God is doing. So every once in a while, God will ask you to pause or he will send a period not because he wants to stop you, but because he wants you still enough to listen. 
For it is only in darkness that men stand still. If you were walking in this room right now, you would walk freely. If the lights cut off, you would duck and stop. And every once in a while, God will cut the lights off on your life. Not so that you would have an accident, but so that you would stand still and see <laughs> the salvation of the Lord. See, in the natural, in the dark, we cannot see. In the spirit, it is darkness that is necessary for sight. So in the spirit, sometimes God will turn the light off so that you can see. This is exactly what happens in our text. And without warning, we get an opportunity to see a little boy named Lot grow up right before our eyes. Right in this text, we get a chance to see a little lad developed in front of our eyes. And if this story was a movie, it would be rated for mature audiences only. Because Lot goes from a boy to a man. All of his mistakes are on Front Street. We get a chance to see him turn back and, and we get a chance to see his wife turn back and become a pillar of salt. We see all of these things happening in his life. And if this was a movie, it would have to be rated R for mature audiences only because there are few people in the world who can witness your development and still treat you with dignity. There are a lot of us in here right now we lost friends and, and, and they lost respect for us because they were with us for who they thought we were. And once they found out that we were not who they assumed us to be, marriages have ended because people wanted perfect people and not partners. Relationships have ended because people have made mistakes. The problem was not the person's mistake. The problem is your assumption that they would never make one. And so now we are here looking at a man develop before our eyes and most of us are not able to see people develop and still treat them with dignity. Most of us cannot hear preachers preach and know they're not perfect. Most of us cannot follow deacons and not know that they still have issues. Most of us will marry people and as long as we're dating and as long as we're drinking mimosas and as long as we have steaks and chicken, everything is fine. But the moment you go through the valley of the shadow of death, all of a sudden you got to get a divorce and go back and live with your mama and, and all of a sudden you don't want to be with them anymore. I wanted to talk to people today because let me tell you something, it takes a mature person to see somebody develop and sit still. Oh God, I, I could really just stop preaching this sermon right now because this is where most of y'all will get off at the bus stop because the bus ain't going any further because the truth is, is most of us can handle people when they are developed, but we struggle to be with them while they are developing. So this is what I, I urge you to do. Just do me a favor like I do every Sunday. Just look at your name and say, neighbor, please be patient with me because God ain't through with me yet. I ain't done cussing, I still do it sometimes. I don't clean up, I don't make up my bed every time I wake up in the morning. I don't wash the dishes every time I go to bed and sometimes I take my shoes off and leave them at the door. Sometimes I drive the car and don't put gas in it. I might not stop by the car wash until next year. I might not wash, but, but, but I'm working on it. Just touch, I'm working on it. I, I'm doing the best I can. I know I told you I wasn't gonna yell at you no more, but I'm sorry, I did it again. Very few people can stay with people and treat them with dignity while they are developing. But I'm here to tell you, I need somebody to stay with me because I'm still developing. I'm, I, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I should be. I'm not, I'm not where I, I'm still being worked on. Is there anybody in the lighthouse and watching online that can just go ahead and tell everybody, put your halo down, take it off of my head, get your expectations from around me. I might disappoint you. Stop lying to people talking about I ain't never going to hurt you. That's a lie. Tell them I ain't going to hurt you on purpose. Yeah. Ain't no telling what I might do. I, I don't know what I might do, but I ain't going to do it intentionally. But if I do, please forgive me. Yeah. This sermon is rated R because this boy is developing right in front of us and, and God is showing us that you got to treat people with dignity even though they're still developing. And here we are, we got Lot right in front of our face and, and, and Lot's life, and he can't even really get into the landscape of the scripture before pain is already exposed. The Bible lets us know that as soon as he is revealed, we have never even heard his name before. All of a sudden he comes into the scene in chapter 11 and his father dies. You know, I've never seen anybody do anything great without crying. 
I can drop the mic and give you a pen and pop the balloon and we can go home right there. I've never seen anybody do anything great without tears. If you're ever going to do anything great, you got to cry. If you're ever going to get a baby into the world, you got to stretch and cry. If you're ever going to do anything great, you got to cry. If you ever do anything worth talking about, it's going to cost you some tears. If you're going to have a marriage, you're going to cry sometime. If you're going to have a relationship, you're going to cry sometime. If you're going to raise children, they're going to have you at the altar saying, Father, I take these children, I give them back. If you're going to do anything worth doing, I wish I had a church in here today. Don't y'all make me yell, just get the lesson. If you're going to do anything worth doing, it's going to make you cry. If you're ever going to really love somebody, you're going to have to cry to do it. Oh, God, help me in this. And if you're ever going to love somebody, you're going to have to cry. And in order for them to love you, they're going to have to cry. You don't escape this world without tears. If you're ever going to do it, if you're ever going to make it to the next level, you're going to cry. I don't care if you're a man or a woman, everybody in here cries. Yeah, more so than others, some more than others, but, but, but it doesn't matter if you do it a lot or do it a little. When you do it, it's worth it. Every, everybody in here cries. Women may cry openly, and women don't think men don't cry. We just don't cry around you. We go in the car and drive around the street, and then we cry, and then put Visine in our eyes, and then come in the house and act like everything is all right. We cry, and we don't always cry with our tears. Sometimes we cry with a bat upside a garbage can. Sometimes we cry by punching a hole in the wall. Some of y'all got a hole in your wall right now, or it's fixed in the back of a door. Everybody in here got a man that done put his fist through a door and didn't have enough sense to measure 14 inches to make sure it went through two two by fours, and then he went knuckle to knuckle with a piece of wood. Not around here telling everybody he got hurt at work. And when you love a man, you'll cover him. Yeah, he did, knowing he ain't telling the truth. Everybody in here cries. Babies cry, adults cry, dogs cry. Everything cries because you can't do anything great without crying. You can't live long without shedding a tear. Do I wish I had a witness in here today? Lot is crying. He's crying because his father has just died. His, his life is, is in shambles because his house is now fatherless. His father has died. And let me tell you, in his day, they were not used to not having fathers in their house like us. We have become anesthetized. We have become, we have become numb to not having fathers in the home. It ain't even, it's just a common thing. But in that day, it was not common. All homes had fathers in them. And whenever a father did not have or was not in the home, whenever there was not a father in the home, the family was in dire straits because then women were not allowed to work. So today, if there's not a father in the house, women can pick up the piece and say, you know what, that's all right. Uh, hey, hey, he, he may have got this baby here, but I can take it from here. And, and there's some women here that will go back to school and get a degree and raise those children and, and come out and graduate. And, and do, all, do I have any women who had to do all of that? Thank God you lived in the 1900s and the 2000s, because if you lived back in the days of Jesus, you would have had a desire to work, but nowhere to work because they wouldn't hire you because women were only good for one thing in that day, and that was having babies and making the house. That's why if you go back and read Proverbs 31, all you women who want to be Proverbs 31, women and be virtuous, it's a couple of things you're missing, like making your own clothes and making your food from scratch. Holler back at your boy. The virtuous woman, she made her the, the blankets on the bed and all that kind of stuff. She would y'all go to Macy's. You are victorious women. I'm not sure about virtuous. <laughs> Holler back now. So women could not work. So when, when, when his father died, his house was in dire straits because his mother would have wanted to take care of him, but she would not have been able to take care of him because she would not have been hired by anybody, which means she would not have, have had an income. And, and so now their house is in turmoil. That's why when, when, when Onan died, the Bible says that his father told him to go into Tamar and get uh, her to go in there and get his wife pregnant. Why? Because without a father, the house house would be empty and without a father they would not have a son so in those days that even if a brother died his brother went into his brother's house and got his wife's pregnant because that's how important it was to have a man in the house in that day are y'all hearing with me 
And so, so, so that, that, that's why Judah told Onan to get his other son's wife pregnant and, and, and it would have been, it would have been all right in those days. It is not all right now. And I'm not being facetious, nor am I being dogmatic, not chauvinistic. I'm telling you the context and culture of that day when his father died, everybody's world fell apart. Lot is confused and he is crying and he's got tears in his eyes. And just as he recovers from losing his father, his grandfather, Terah, takes him in into the house and the Bible says then he dies. Can you see the tears coming from his eyes? Can you see him crying at the loss of his father? His grandfather picks him up and now he's like, all right, I'm going to make it. And then the only man to care about him after his father dies, then he dies. What he does not know is that God has a plan, but he cannot see God's plan because all he feels is pain. Is there anybody in here that will admit sometimes you miss God's plan because all you feel is pain? Pain has a way of making you forget about what's actually happening. Come on, talk to me. Pain, pain will make you, you can be in Maui, Hawaii and get a headache and not enjoy it. Because whenever pain shows up, it makes you forget about your environment. Whenever pain shows up, it makes you forget that you got a $60,000 car in your garage. Whenever pain shows up, it makes you forget that you've got $100,000 worth of clothes in your closet. Whenever pain shows up, it makes you forget that you've had 17, 19, 20, 30, 50 good days in a row. When pain comes, the only day you care about is the day you feel it. I'm trying to get in this house today before to break some strongholds, but anybody in here ever really been in pain? And we'll admit that pain makes you forget about every good day you had before it. Nobody says, well, God, I'll take this headache because I haven't had one all month. Whenever the headache comes, you're giving it 30 minutes. This stuff don't work. You take the Advil at 12 noon. If it ain't working by 12.01, you take a leave. If that don't work, then you go to Moxicillin. If that don't work, then you got a Vicodin. Now you're really good. Are y'all with me today? Am I helping anybody so far? He has no idea at this time that God has a plan because all he feels is pain. That's what Job said in Job 16 and 16. He said, my face is red because of my tears and I've got dark shadows around my eyelids. He's crying. He's crying. He's crying. That's a man crying. That's a man's man crying. A rich man crying. He's got more money than anybody in the East, but all he can focus on is his tears. Tears, tears. He's crying tears. He's crying tears, tears, tears. But he doesn't recognize that after his father dies, after his grandfather dies, the next person that would walk into his life is Abraham. Now look at God. Takes his father and his grandfather to introduce him to the father who fathered his grandfather and father. Because Abraham is the father of the faith. So he loses a father and loses a grandfather to get the father of all fathers, not recognizing that God was trying to get him to another place of which I will explain to you later because Abraham is the father of the faithful and his father and grandfather were idolaters. The ultimate goal for God is to get Lot saved understanding that he cannot get him saved through his father and grandfather. So he has to take his natural father to put him in the hands of his spiritual father so that his spiritual father can give him what his natural father could not offer. I'm getting ready to help somebody in this place today because there are some of y'all who have been grow, who have grew up without fathers in your home and you're wondering what your life would have been like if you would have had them in your life. But the blessing is, is that although you may not have had a father, you got a spiritual father who repeats, who keeps giving you the word over and over and over and over again and encouraging you over and over and over again. The difference is, is a natural father is in your house, a spiritual father, you have to go to the house. And the reason why some of us are behind is because if your pastor was in your house, you develop. But the problem is, is you have a choice when you will eat from his table. Y'all ain't going to say amen in this place today. But I'm trying to help somebody. Somebody say this is the year of elevation. 
What you don't understand is that sometimes crying is transportation. That's why they say cry a river. See, sometimes you got to cry enough so that God can take you. The reason why some of you all haven't reached destiny yet is because you ain't cried enough. After you suffered a while, God help me in this church, then God will establish you. Is there anybody in here that's in a season of tears? I came to speak to everybody who's in a season of tears. Be not weary and well doing. Those tears are about to lead you to the next level. Touch your neighbor and say cry. Just tell them, just say cry, just cry, just cry. Matter of fact, some of you all say those are not real tears. Ain't no such thing as a fake tear. Because you got to understand that tears are transportation. Sometimes God uses tears to get you to the next level. That means sometimes you're going to hurt all the way to the next level. Sometimes you're going to limp all the way to the next level. Sometimes you're going to be depressed all the way to the next level. Sometimes you're going to be frustrated all the way to the next level. Stop trying to hide your tears. Stop trying to act like you're not hurting. When somebody asks you what's wrong, stop lying, talking about nothing. And break down and cry and say everything. I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like I'm going to give up. Up. I feel like God doesn't love me. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. Why? Because the more you cry, the more God can do. The Bible says David cried out unto the Lord. You've got to start crying. It wasn't until Jonah started crying until the fish released him. It wasn't until David started crying that he got out of the valley of the shadow of death. You can stand there and try to be tough if you want and sit in church with your arms folded like you already know the Bible. But all I need is 50 people to cry out and say, just as I am, I come. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know why I act like this. I don't know why I respond like this. But here I am, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The reason why most people don't get a lot out of church is because they don't cry out. All they do is come in here and sit down and act like God owes them something and sit here and act like God ain't been good and sit here and act like you just deserve to be alive. But I'm thanking God for those of y'all who stand and knowing that you ought to be dead somewhere, sleeping in your grave, and you don't mind crying out and saying hallelujah. You don't mind throwing your hands in the air and saying thank you, Jesus. Somebody ought to cry out unto the Lord. He cried. He cried out. Tears are transportation. If you don't cry, you're going to break. Help me in this church, Lord. Your tears are taking you somewhere. You can't be too macho to cry. Come on, brothers. You can't be too macho to cry. You be surprised what your spouse would feel if they would see a tear come down your eye. They sitting up here telling you how they feel and you sitting up here stone-faced. That translate, oh, you don't care. Oh, uh, Lord, I, I know I'm preaching in here today. And you're looking at her talking about you're too emotional, all you do is cry. That's why women live longer. That's why women live longer because they get it out whenever it happens, they cry. Whenever something happens, they cry. And we sit in here and we hold it in and we have a heart attack at 55. Because you're too tough to stay alive. Somebody say cry. You got to cry. It may hurt the entire way, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep going. And, and, it, and it wasn't until, oh, as a matter of fact, the Bible says when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, this is the only time we see the Bible said Jesus cried. It's the shortest verse in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. When something hurts, admit it. This is the best sermon you heard this week. When something hurts, admit it. Stop talking. It ain't bothering me. I'm good. Yes, it is. And we can see it. You don't live with anybody 20 years and they can tell you ain't nothing wrong and you believe them. What's wrong? I'm being overworked and underpaid. What's wrong? I need a new car. What's wrong? My rent is too high. Let me tell you the truth. I got in over my head. Tell the truth. Yeah. Why are you stressed out? Because I shop with my bill money. Yeah. What's wrong? I'm tired of being single. I got ugly friends and they already married. What's wrong with me? Yeah. 
Y'all ain't gonna tell the truth. Y'all don't wanna talk about what's real. Don't act like you don't be looking at them like, I'm finer than her, my hair better than her, I'm cuter than her. How she got on, man? You better cry. Sometimes crying is the only way you can get over something. Jesus said, show me where you laid him. They showed him where Lazarus was, and he wept because that's the only way he could get over it. You better start crying. You better let that stuff out. Around here trying to be tough all the time. I'm going to be good. Keep your head up, dog. better get down on your knees and say, Father, I'll stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know if thou would draw thyself from me. Oh, whether shall I go? David said, Lord, my enemies outnumber the hairs on my head. I'm crying out, God, because I need your help. He started crying. He said, Lord, I need you to do something to them because if I do something to them, you're going to do something to me. So, Lord, I'm crying out. Is there anybody that's just going to cry out into the church right now? I wish I could get 500 people just start crying out, Lord, it's not my mother, it's not my father, it's me, oh Lord. My husband, yes, he crazy, but he also married a fool. My wife crazy, but she also married a fool. Somebody ought to just cry out into the Lord and say, Lord, change my life, change my circumstances, give me a raise on my job, stop acting like everything is all right. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Somebody ought to cry out unto the Lord. Though he slay me, that was him crying out. Yet will I trust in him. Touch somebody say you can trust God in your tears. You can trust God in your tears. And women, when your men cry, don't you be getting on them. You get to cry all the time. We cry once, now you want to call us weak. We cry too. And if we cry on your, the reason why men don't cry on women's shoulders is because y'all use it against us later. Oh, you ain't going to say amen. Oh, now you want to be a punk. Now you're crying. What you crying for now? When y'all get hard and all of a sudden you stop crying and we start crying, now you got something to say about it. When that man cry, put your lips on his face and wipe those tears away. When that man cry, dig in his eye and get the eye booger out and wipe it on your face. Oh, y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. I'm trying to get you to get that man to open up. When he start crying and snot runs down his nose, take your finger and wipe it off. And see when he fall all the way apart and be like, my baby love me. My baby love me. When a woman fed up, Dun, 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 dun. Ain't nothing you can do. Woman be like, you know, when a woman fed up, brothers, you be crying, she be up like. I'm done crying, so whenever you get done. I done cried the first 10 years, and now you want to shed a tear all of a sudden. Out the back. Y'all know I ain't lying. Jonah was in the fish. The Bible said he cried out. Fish spit him out. You could get out if you cry out. Tears are transportation. They get you somewhere. You get over it when you cry. The Bible calls it praying or praise. You just got to open up your mouth. Jesus got on the cross. He never said a mumbling word. Gets on the cross. He cries out seven times. But he, notice he didn't cry until he was ready to go somewhere. God told Abraham, he said, look, man, I need you to leave the country and I need you to leave your kidding folk. And some of y'all ain't going to get to where God wants you to be. 
until you put a little space between you and some of your family members. And it's all kind of relationships that are wreaking havoc on your relationships. It's like, you know, brothers, if you're married to a woman and, and, and therefore shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, you can't be married to your mama and wife at the same time. No woman's gonna compete with your mama. She gonna let you have your mama, but your mama can't do what she can do. And she gonna tell you that. And ladies, y'all stop clapping, sit down and be quiet. Because every time your man can't buy something, you go to your mama to get it. And so you get all arrogant, talking about, well, I already know my mama gonna do it. See how quiet, see how, you see how they, y'all some hypocritical women. Y'all just was up here shouting and, and shouting when I was talking about them. And then when I say something about you, all of a sudden your hallelujah belongs to you, not Jesus. Ooh, y'all get on my nerves sometimes. You go to your daddy and be like, well, whatever, I'm, whatever he won't buy, my daddy will. Your daddy gave you away. <laughs> he gave you away. No, seriously, that is actually a symbolism. When your, when your daddy give you away, he telling that dude, <laughs> you can take over from here, bro. <laughs> That's the only part of my daughters getting married that I'm looking forward to is getting them off my bills. Other than that, I want to keep them. God told Abraham, get out of the country and away from your kindred. Come to the land and I'll show you. Now, Abraham obeyed part of the instruction. He left the country, but he couldn't, live, he couldn't leave the kin. The Bible says he took his wife, which he should have, because <laughs> she was in the household. He took all of his possessions. Should he have taken them? Maybe, maybe not. But then the Bible says he took all of the people that he had gathered in Haran. And the reason why he took all the people that he had gathered in Haran is because he was taking anybody who was willing to go. See, that's the problem with most of us. It's just because they are willing to go don't mean they should go. There ought to be some people in your life, they ought to be willing to go forward, but you have already assessed the situation and recognized and said, you are willing to go, but this is where you get off because God told me there is somebody in here who knows that there is somebody you've been walking with and God told you to walk away from them and you have turned your future into your past by bringing them with you. Now, let me help you understand something. What Abraham does not know is that there is a famine coming. He goes from Ur to Haran and from Haran to Canaan. And when he gets to Canaan, the Bible says there is a famine that comes. What he does not know is that God actually gave him good advice. He says, don't bring your kid and folk with you. Why? Not because he's mean, but because where you are going, there isn't enough to feed everybody you're going to take. Where you're going, I'm going to provide daily bread for you and your household. There is a famine coming. Rations are going to be short. There's not going to be a surplus. Abraham, I know you're rich, but it doesn't matter because when the land dries up, so will your wealth. I'm going to take you somewhere where I can only feed what's in your house. And you're trying to bring everybody that's in your life. And I am not going to provide for your entire circle. So Abraham, tell the people at the Lighthouse Church that they've got a choice. Either shrink your circle or I will starve it. The word of the Lord is shrink your circle or I will starve it. There are some people in your life right now. You have cried enough to know what decision to make. And yet you're trying to take them to Canaan with you. They have betrayed you enough. And you still talking about, well, I'm going to see. They have proven themselves. But you won't believe them. 
God has already showed you the warning signs, but you won't adhere to them. So you run the stop sign and then ask God to forgive you for the accident. God already told you that ain't going to work. You, you heard him, didn't you? you? You knew it. Matter of fact, let's take God out of it. You told yourself. The whole time you was like, I don't know why I'm in this. But it is what Napoleon Hill calls in the book, Outwitting the Devil. He calls it hypnotic rhythm. That the devil will get us hypnotized into our rhythm and we will become victims of our own habits. Most people are in habit, not in relationship. You just friends with them because y'all know each other. You just in the relationship because you scared to meet somebody new. You just don't want to start over. And so you're in the hypnotic rhythm. And God says, I'm calling you to step out of that place and away from those people because where I am taking you, I have not provided enough for them to enter with you. And when they go, you have to release them because in the year of elevation, with your heart as sincere as it is, I'm afraid that most of us will try to save relationships and breathe CPR into moments that God killed. Anybody who can walk away from you, let them. I don't want you begging anybody else to stay. because there is a famine coming. If you let them go, they'll die out of your sight. If you take them with you, they're going to die in your house. Abraham, I didn't just tell you to leave where you were. I told you to leave them. You overpacked and you overate. Any, any overpackers in here? I just rebuke people who have to check luggage for two days. You are slowing us all up. We got to wait at the conveyor belt for an overnight trip and you check the bag. I got to have options, you never know. <laughs> the option is to not have options. We might go out at night and then it might be cold in the day and then it might malfunction and my safety pin won't work. I got to have options. You know how much it costs to overpack? Because carry-ons are free. You pay $50 extra not to wear an outfit. Now, there's certain things you need to take a lot of. You need a lot of underwear. Take a whole lot of them every time. You got to have it because you never know what nature might do, you know. But you didn't need nine pair of shoes for two days. I'm trying to get you to understand that you've misdiagnosed it. It was not options. It was the lack of the ability to make a choice. So since you couldn't make a choice, you brought all your choices. There are some things you got to make a choice to leave. God help me in this church today. Do you all understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? It's about making a decision. Who, what should I leave behind? Because it cannot go with me. It is too expensive to bring all of your options. When Jesus went up to the mountain of transfiguration, he brought all 12 disciples. When he went up higher, he left nine behind and only took three. It was too expensive to take 12 because all of them would not understand glory. 
Some people can understand the bottom. Only a few can understand the top. And the higher you go, the more opinions you will have. That's why you got to leave somebody at the foot of the mountain so that they won't put your foot in their mouth. As you go higher, you got to decide who you're going to leave behind. Like, I know this is an uncomfortable sermon because you just want to be nice. Hey, everybody, come on. I want to take everybody. Abraham, leave your country and leave some of them kidding folk behind. Now, most people say, well, then how did he get to take Lot? No, that's not true because he adopted Lot. Because Lot was in his household. Remember, he took over for his father and his grandfather, so now Lot is a part of the house. Lot doesn't count. Lot can go. If you go through the uh, uh, adoption process, then it can go. You, you, gotta, you, you, can't, you can't date God. You got to marry him. Are, are y'all with me today? You, you got to make it official. He goes and he takes him with him. And God says, go to a place. Everybody say, go to a place. He says, go to a place and I will show you. This is going to help somebody because sometimes God will say, go, and then he will show most of us are asking God for proof before we move. God, let me know this is of you. God, let me know this is where you want me to go. God, if you want me to move here, let me know. God, if this is what you want me to do, God says, no, I told you to go. And when you get there, I will show you that you have arrived. God sometimes says, go, and then he shows. And sometimes when God tells you to go, one of the proofs that he told you to go is everybody behind you is saying, where are you going? Can you imagine everybody saying, where are you going? Because now he's leaving, he's leaving Haran and now he's leaving Canaan and guess where he goes next? Egypt. Egypt, bro? You going to Egypt, dog? Egypt? Where Pharaoh at? Oh God, I'm about to help. This is going to wear y'all out right here. Y'all ready for this? Canaan is where he was called. Egypt was where he could be fed. So he left where he was called to go where he could be fed. Mm, I just said a whole lot. Because there are a lot of us who will abort our destiny going where the food is, not going where the calling is. You were called to this relationship, but you in that one because you're happy. God didn't say go where you were happy. He said go where you were called. Y'all don't want to say, y'all don't want to say nothing in here, but I'm about to come through here like a mighty Russian wind. The danger of leaving where you are called to go where you are happy. Mm. Oh, Lord, help me in this church. <laughs> God said, I called you to Canaan, not to Egypt. And I know that there was a famine coming, but did you not know that I had enough strength? Ask Elijah. You don't trust me. I sent Elijah to a desert and dried up the brook and he stayed there. And because he was obedient, I brought a raven to feed him in the desert and made a river in a dry place. God says, oh, you've got it twisted. You think that because you're in a dry place, I can't feed you. I came to tell you that God has enough strength to feed you where you're called. Stop jumping ship every time you feel uncomfortable where God called you. Stop leaving every time God, oh God, I wish I had a real church. I'm, I'm only, this is only for about five of y'all. Stop leaving because you don't feel comfortable. Stop leaving because it ain't working out the way you want it to work out. Stop leaving because the sun ain't shining. Stop leaving because your boyfriend lost his job. Stop leaving where you've been called to go where you're comfortable. Touch three people and say, sit still. I'm leaving Houston and I'm moving. I'm going somewhere else. I can't find no opportunity. If you can't find an opportunity in Houston, you ain't looking for one. You think going somewhere else is going to change your life? You think if you move to Florida, everything is going to be better? You think if you go to New York, everything is going to be better? You think if you go to California, go, go. But the problem is you're going to be there when you get there. 
Abraham, your problem was not that you ended up in Egypt. Your problem was is that you left the country where I called you. You went where you were comfortable and not where you were called. Lord, help me in this church. I know I'm wearing some of y'all good and out right now. I can tell right now you've been talking to the Lord and the Lord been talking to you and I can look in your face right now. I have messed up all of y'all plans. Some of y'all had plans to do X, Y, and Z and I'm messing them up. You're right. You're doggone right. I'm on assignment to get you to the year of elevation. God says, sit your butt still. I called you to Canaan and not Egypt. Oh, and by the way, the Bible says when he got to Egypt, Pharaoh tried to take his wife. So you're going to end up where you're comfortable and lose what you brought with you. Oh God. You went over there to get one thing and you're going to lose what you took. Oh, you don't believe me. The Bible says that Pharaoh got to look at Abraham, wife Sarah and say, Woo! I got to have her. Bible says he sent his servants down there and she actually ended up in Pharaoh's house, which was actually almost like an engagement. Pharaoh was about to make it happen. And if Pharaoh would have got his hands on Sarah, ain't nothing Abraham could have did. You leave where you're called to go where you're comfortable and you lose what you brought with you. He ran from a famine, took his wife to Egypt, and now they got to start lying because when Pharaoh wants Sarah, he says, all right, baby, this is what we're going to do. He says, tell Pharaoh that we sisters and brothers because if he think we sisters and brothers, then he won't, he won't try to take you. He won't, he won't think that we ought to be married. So let's, let's just, he, he, let's, let's just look, at, look at how lies enter when you leave calling to go to comfort. Hmm? Are y'all listening to me? His tears took him to Abraham. They traveled to Egypt. And now everything looked like it's about to go south. Famine comes. If Abraham would have stood still, he would have knew he was serving a God who made manna fall down in the desert. Do you know that when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they couldn't find food, whenever they got hungry, bread started falling out of the sky? Don't you let a famine make you think it's time to move? If you'll stay faithful, God will make a river in the desert. If you'll stay faithful, he will let manna fall down from heaven. You can go to a new location and still starve. You got to go where you're called not where you're looking for comfort. I, I sense that I'm speaking to somebody in here today because some of y'all were just getting ready to leave Houston. You had made up your mind, we moving. And you thought that when you got there, it was going to be better. God says, if you'll be faithful and sit still, I'll make it rain. Let me finish this up and let y'all go. Lot, at this current point, is on his way to hell. Did you know that? And look at how good God is. Ma'am, they take an a illegitimate trip, and God still intervenes and makes sure that Pharaoh doesn't get this man's wife. Look at how God will bless you when you're going in the wrong direction. Is there anybody here that just want to spend about 30 seconds thanking God that he'll have grace when you go the wrong direction? Is there anybody in here that just thank God and say, God, I know I didn't have no business going over there. But look, won't he cover you? Abraham is so blessed that God blesses him on an illegitimate trip and soon will bless him through an illegitimate child. Look at how God will make a crooked way straight. How he'll smooth out a rough mountain. Somebody, y'all just praise God right now for all that he's done for you.
And let me show you how much God loves Lot. Lot is on his way to hell because Lot is born in the house of idolaters. Look at how much God loves Lot. He makes sure that Lot ends up in the house where a man believes in faith. And if you read the Bible, the Bible says that Moses had 318 servants. And the Bible says that he had 318 trained servants, which means that everything that ever went into Abraham's house, Abraham trained it. They were so trained that they were servants, but then they came up against five kings and was able to defeat the army of five kings. Can you imagine having somebody go from flipping eggs to slicing the throat? They were so trained that they could make biscuits from scratch and knock you out. His servants were trained, which means that God put Lot in the house of somebody who would train him in the faith. And Lot goes from being an idolater to being saved. The Bible says that it would please God that all men be saved. Now Lot is saved because he had to lose his father and he had to cry over his grandfather and did not recognize that his tears was transportation to the father of all fathers. And now Lot is saved and he is on his way to heaven. I am trying to tell you that everything you lost was God's way of getting you to something better. Be not weary and well-doing, for you will reap a harvest if you faint not. I was talking to Steve yesterday, and Steve said, Pastor, did you know that tears are broken up into three parts? He said, number one, your tears have minerals in it. They have salt in them. Got that. He said, there is another part of your tear that makes sure that the tear doesn't evaporate. He says, but did you not know that in every tear there is oil? The oil makes sure that the tear adheres to your eye, which means every time you cry, you increase your anointing. I wish somebody in this place over the next 30 seconds would just start crying out unto the Lord and see what God will do in exchange for your worship. That's all you need from God, that's cool. But I'm gonna give y'all about 30 more seconds to put what you need on your mind and begin to cry out unto the Lord and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know, God, it's me standing in the need of prayer. I'm tired of being frustrated, I'm tired of being angry, I'm tired of being delusioned. I want more grace. Many of you, like Lot, have grew up in a house where your parents didn't really take you to church like that and look at you now. Many of y'all grew up in crack homes and grew up with alcoholics and grew up with parents that didn't get along. You ought to be crazy somewhere statistically. You ought to be on drugs somewhere statistically. But thank God that he sent you an Abraham. Thank God that he sent you somebody who spoke into your life. Is there anybody here want to say, I don't look like what I came through. I don't look like where I was raised. I don't look. Is there anybody here that'll start thanking God and say, I don't look like what I've been through. Stand to your feet in this place. Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We didn't know that you were testing us through these tears. We didn't recognize, God, that our tears were transportation and you were trying to get us somewhere. All we knew is that we were crying and we didn't know that in the pain you had a plan. Thank you for not forgetting about us, oh God. Thank you that you haven't given up on us. Thank you that you haven't thrown us by the wayside. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. For our illegitimate decisions, you still made grace abound. Thank you, Holy Ghost. That we went into Egypt under our own power, but we came out under your own power. We thank you that you were with us the entire time. And so we give you all glory. We give you